Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Lauren Booth, a journalist and an author who specializes in amplifying Muslim voices and your stories across different platforms in the mainstream, including, uh, but not limited to social media. And I'm really delighted to have been invited by the Islamic Literary Society to carry out today's interview for them, alhamdulillah. And it's a really special one to me as well, because it's a, a doctor who I've wanted to speak to a long time and whose work I am already familiar with. So our guest today is Dr. Catherine Bullock. She's a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And her teaching focus is political Islam from a global perspective. I told you I'd be excited about this. You can understand why now. And her research focus areas include Muslims in Canada, their history, contemporary lived experiences, debates on the veil, and media representations of Islam and Muslims. Catherine was the editor of the American Journal of Islamic Social Sciences for five years and the vice president of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists in North America from 2006 to 2009. Dr. Catherine is currently president of Compass Books as well, which are dedicated to publishing top quality books about Islam and Muslims in the English language. She's originally from Australia and she embraced Islam in 1994 and now lives in Canada with her husband and her children. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Catherine. Welcome to the Islamic Literary Society. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a really a pleasure to be with you today. Alhamdulillah, thanks so much. Tell us first and foremost um, about your publications. I have a couple of books that were done earlier on in my career, and then I learned that in the academic world, books uh, sit lower down on the scale than peer-reviewed journal articles do, so I switched my attention to that. And the latest one, which uh, I don't think is on my bio that you read, I I'm actually very excited about. It's a study of veiling, uh, veiling as villains in BBC's Merlin and a US show called Stargate. Love it. I love it. I watched Merlin. We were addicted. It's quite, it's about 15 years old now. It's, it's, um, oh, it is, but doesn't matter because it was really groundbreaking at the time. Mm. Well, in Merlin and but neither of these shows, so Stargate, which is a US science fiction show that ran for 10 years and Merlin, neither of them that really have any Muslim characters, but the villains are dressed as Muslims. And that really, I, I just was watching with my kids and all of a sudden you see this image on the screen and you're like, uh oh, what's that all about? So then I decided to go ahead and do a, a deeper investigation. We're going to come to that because we will link that to um, what we're going to be talking about today, which is one of your, I guess, most highly accessed um, papers, Rethinking Muslim Women and the Veil, Challenging Historical and Modern Stereotypes. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. First of all, I want to ask you about writing and perhaps your method of writing. Are you still somebody who has, like me, a bit of a there you go. There's my ink pen and there's my kind of old style book. I love to write notes. How important is writing to you on a daily basis or typing for that matter? I love writing with a pen and paper too. And I have a notebook like yours. Uh, my brother gave me for my birthday the recent one, which is actually a red, uh, red, red one like that. But actually, those are just for your scattered thoughts, your brainstorming. Mm -hmm. I, I actually really like writing on the computer because I love the backspace and the delete function. And I love the ability to move text around because yeah. I, I like to just write as a flow. Uh, and if I'm if I don't remember a date, like, you know, what year did Napoleon invade Egypt? I'll just put a star. I'll put 17 and then I'll put stars and I'll just like go through as fast as I can. And then I'll go back and, and do all that like fact checking and you put your references in and all of that. So I really love the fact that you can cut and paste and delete and move text around because when you go back, you realize, oh, that doesn't belong there. It belongs there and stuff like that. But I like to brainstorm on paper first. I do these. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's got an actual name where you write down an idea in a circle and then you write down all the circles all around it with lines and then you draw them and you connect them. And I mm -hmm. use that to create my 
uh, not only my outline for writing, but also my plan for research. Like, how am I going to go ahead and look all these topics up? I really love finding out how people get their ideas together. And I've already, you know, you've you've reminded me about doing those, um, you know, the, the, the circular planning uh, picture is so much, um, is so vivid to us, isn't it? It goes into a different part of our brain. I really love that. Mm. And I don't like actually doing that on software I find in software it's like it's a bit of a job it's a bit technical and by the time I've got the things in the right place I've lost the idea right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well I, I guess if we were computer engineers or something we, we wouldn't maybe feel like that but true true and what about um, your personal development um, as a writer how does writing contribute to to your daily development how important is it I've been writing since I was a kid I used to act out scenarios in my backyard and then go and write them down. Uh, and I was, you know, ready, ready to write the novel, but I, I, I never got very far with that. Um, when I was an undergrad, I enrolled in English literature as my major because I thought that's what I wanted to be involved in. But I discovered that I was actually really bad at, I don't know, I couldn't understand what the mood was or, you know, the tense or how the author was doing this or that thing. And so I got myself into social science writing, which is a completely different way of writing. And so then you get, then you start learning the academic voice, which is mm. often very passive and very, and in the beginning, we weren't even allowed, allowed to use the word I. So my writing was always connected to my academia and you do it on a daily basis uh, as, as sort of you need to, as, as your writing deadlines uh come upon you but in recent years I've wanted to get back to the to the creative fiction side or the not what, what a, a genre called creative non-fiction I think that's called uh, like memoirs and stuff like that um Ooh, so I've language, um, yeah. <laughs> so I've I've been to some workshops and I've I've started to try to do that journaling where you where you practice every day uh, but unfortunately I don't know it's, I find it really hard to fit into my schedule it just remains an aspiration most of the time Inshallah, inshallah. I, I'm just really glad I kept diaries because I couldn't have written my memoirs. And, um, and when you look back at them, I realized how many lies I was telling myself as well. But that's a story for another day. I wonder, um, Doctor, because, because we really want to develop writers uh, with the Islamic Literary Society, and we really want to inspire Muslims back to books. What, do you, what is the relationship you see between reading, writing, and social development? What I mean is, can reading and writing help, or how can it help Muslims in promoting an Islamic worldview and understanding the world around us? You know, that's such a profound question. I was having a chat with one of, with one of my kids recently who's quite allergic to writing, uh, even to reading. I, I started reading to my kids when, when they were three months old and I read to them every night for 12 or 13 years, but only two out of a the three have picked up reading as a habit. And the one who is less interested basically said, like, there's no need to read anymore or even to write because you have Google uh, Google uh, voice to text. You just talk. Google writes it down. And then you, you have um, Google. So the will read to you audio books and things. And in school, they don't even teach writing anymore, handwriting. You're joking me. I'm not. I'm not joking. So... Because everyone knows that life now is, is on the laptop. Um, so I was thinking, you know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he came into an oral society. You know, the Arabs, mashallah, were just, they had amazing memories. They could, they wrote, they, they spoke amazing poetry. But the Quran came with the command to read. And um, Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, when they had prisoners of war, if if any of them could teach a Muslim to read, they would be freed. So there's something incredibly important about writing. Uh, writing helps preserve, I mean, oral culture gets passed down through the mind, through the memory, but writing makes it accessible to, to so many more people. Books, basically, books, because those are the things that can be preserved and la last. Mm -hmm. When uh, during, I think it was the time of Umar, Cal uh, Caliph Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him. And there'd been a lot of people who'd memorized the Quran who'd been dying in battle, and they were worried that the Quran was going to 
be lost because if it's only preserved in the, the memory of the, of the people who have that skill, not everyone has that skill, then, you know, it, it, needed to, it needs to be written down in, in a document. So, sorry, that's a bit of a long winded answer but so I really feel that the importance of books and writing and books change your life reading the Quran changed my life so many people will tell you that reading the Quran changed their life I mean some of them get attracted by hearing the Adhan which is an oral thing Mm -hmm. but after that it's it's the reading and it's not just the Quran we you know you 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 want to a a self-help book you know all the books about how to grow rich and how to make friends and how to lose weight and there's there's so much of our life development is is wrapped up in advice that we get from books but I do get that today is about stories and and I do get that maybe we're moving a little bit back to an oral tradition but that doesn't negate that somebody somewhere needs to be the writer of these things. And that that action has provenly the, the connection between using your hand to shape the letters creates such a firmness, a firm hold for the information in your mind. Exactly. Oh, I, I mean, find things are just sliding through. I know I'm old, but even so. Well, that's true. I mean, even Imam Shafi used to apparently, if I'm if I'm not incorrect, he used to even just like write on his hand, just as a way to help it remember when when he was listening to his teacher. I, I think that's a story of Imam Shafi that I've heard. Mashallah. But you know, lang- language is the way of us trying to verbalize the ideas and concepts in, in our mind, and uh, I think it's just important that 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 it get written down. Well, we're very glad of your writing. I'm um, excited to be talking to you specifically about rethinking Muslim women and the veil, challenging historical and modern stereotypes. Um, I think you've done a couple of revisions of this. Um, tell us what the book argues in a nutshell and, and how it's been how it's been forming and growing. The book argues that the Western concept that Muslim women are oppressed, which is treated like a truism, has become a stereotype because it's then applied to every single Muslim woman on the planet, mm. and that's unfair. There might be Muslim women who are who are living an oppressed life, but there are also non-Muslim atheist women who are who are living an oppressed life, and so this idea should not be should not be used to create uh, assumptions about Muslim women or policy based on uh, po- policy for about Muslim women targeted towards Muslim women. And that the veil means different things to different people. And every woman has her own journey towards it. And this book, which was my PhD thesis, and I did my interviews in 1996 and 7. I wrote, I wrote it in 1999. It came out as a book in 2001. I, it hasn't been revised. I've just done one. They did, a, they did a reprint, a second edition, where I just added some things to the preface. But honestly, I, I'm, I'm, of course, happy, but also a little bit surprised that something from 2001 is still so, people still want to talk to me about it. I still get emails from people all around the world saying that they've read it and how much it has meant to them. Of course, that's extremely gratifying as an author because you, when you're writing, you're alone in your little space and you, mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to happen to the words that go out. But on the other hand, When I wrote that, I had some kind of like naive enlightenment belief that, you know, knowledge would help change minds and that my book, I was bringing Muslim women voices, giving them the platform as you, that's how you introduced. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only it hasn't made a difference, things are worse now now than they were then. Oh, I don't, don't, I mean, yeah, yeah, we tend to, we do have a tendency as passionate um, kind of converts. And I like that naive enlightenment moment because, you know, that you come in and you're like, I've got this, guys. I am running with the ball and it's never been thought of before, but here I am. But we also have these kind of um, elevated platforms as white Western Muslims from the UK or Australia. And clearly your book has had an impact because it's still being accessed by sisters. And when I, you know, was going through the introduction and the first and the first chapters, I was thinking, yes, yes, yes. And you, you at the very least, as an affirmation that we're not crazy, because I think one of the things that you brought up was this, this feeling of otherness that hijabis have, that why don't you see us? 
you can sit in a room full of people and they'll say, oh, you know, uh, Muslim, Muslim women, not you, though, but all Muslim women, other Muslim women, they're oppressed. Um, you, you, did, you, did you want to, to actually open up a debate with the mainstream? Did you expect this? You know, what, what, what outcomes did you want? And how far have things moved away from where, th- where, where it was when you wrote this? When I did the book and I interviewed Muslim women about why they wear the hijab and what it means to them, I expected, because they talked about spiritual journeys, about closeness to God, about feelings of peace, about piety, about the sense of worship, about feeling liberated from the beauty myth that Western culture imposes upon women, uh, about being happy, I expected people to take those voices seriously Mm. and with respect and to say, okay, next time I meet a Muslim woman in a headscarf, I'm going to assume that she put it on by choice, that it's a part of a spiritual journey and that she's really happy and I can, you know, engage with her on a a human-to-human level, maybe even talk about something else. It doesn't have to be. We, We always get stuck into talking about the headscarf as if it's the only thing that matters. That's what I expected. Once you heard the voice of the Muslim woman, unfortunately, what we what we've seen is well, she's a false consciousness. She doesn't know that she's saying something silly. She's been brainwashed. Even if she says it's her choice, we don't believe her. Or even if she says it's her choice, we know objectively that it's um, it can't be good for her because we know better. So now you have all these laws around uh, the world, you know, France, Belgium, Germany, Switzerland, Quebec and Canada, uh, basically saving women from themselves. So we we don't even care what they say about themselves anymore because we can't believe a word they say. We have to protect them because they can't protect themselves. Let's go. It's the opposite. Yeah, let's go, because you picked up a word there, uh, protection, and uh, th- that is absolutely vital to the apologia for really bad laws that that, that, that subjugate women uh, uh, according to our dress code. Um, one of your chapters is called The Veil and the Feminist Approach. Can you, can you take us into what you were talking about, the perception that the veil is a symbol of Islam's oppression and how women really police other women? There is a genre of uh, maybe what we'd call secular feminist responses to the veil, which argue that women's sexuality should be free and unbound. They should wear whatever they like. They should be able to walk down the street naked and not oppressed and not attacked by any man. And to cover up or to to be part of a, a dress code or a religion which says you should cover up is automatically oppressive because it's inhibiting your free your sexuality as a woman and men don't have to so therefore it's unequal it just discriminates against women as well you in the preface uh in the beginning that you know you're negative um the way you were negatively impacted when you put on hijab even in toronto Mm. was shocking to you because you're like okay I've got a headscarf on maybe you and I recognize that our grandmothers used to wear headscarves when they went out no biggie they just used to tie it under here my gran maybe not so much in Australia (laughs) but definitely in the UK (laughs) um and uh, this is going to be fine it's still me what did you actually encounter and and how do you think that impacted um you know your passion for this topic when I started wearing the headscarf, I believed I lived. I, li- I believed the story that the society tells itself. We are a secular liberal society. I'd been studying liberalism at university, and liberalism says each citizen chooses the contents of their own good life. Each citizen chooses their good life. So I had chosen my good life, mm. and it was Islam. Why is everyone? And, and I got so much negative reaction. I went around to all of my professors and I said to them, I've become a Muslim and next time you see me, I'll be wearing a headscarf. And I did this like with five or six of them. And I had to sit there and go go through this whole story with all of them. Oh, but we're not, you were known as a feminist and oh, but we don't hear about white Western women becoming Muslim. And one prof told me to go away and read all these Marxist critiques of Islam. Wow. Um, And another prof uh, 
told me if I, I, I must be like wishy-washy intellectually and if, if he levitated, would I start to worship him? And when I put the headscarf on, you know, all these people in the corridor, people who had, I'd been in the program for a year and a half already and I thought I had all these friends and then they're like, oh, Hamas did this and this, as if it was my fault. And I was like, where's the, you know, secular liberal good life? She can choose her own good life. Like, yeah. wh- wh- what's going on here? So when I entered the program, this is the PhD program, I was planning to study ancient Greek relativism. That was the proposal I'd been accepted with and compare it to modern re- cultural relativism. And then my supervisors, well, to do this topic, you'll have to learn ancient Greek. And I'm like, oh, I- I don't think I'm going to do that. And then I was getting all these negative reactions. Like even I'd go to the department of a different department and the secretary would talk to me in a very rude way. And I'm like, but, you know, like yesterday I, w- I could be here and you'd be really nice with me. I'm Catherine Bullitt with a, with an Australian accent and today I'm wearing yeah. a scarf. Like, yeah. So that I decided that was something worth investigating and I suppose that's where the passion came from because that then became my my new topic. Just one more question on this area. And um, how then did the professors overseeing your PhD react to this quite bullshy move? The, the one that I finally chose was, the, was because he was able to be empathetic with me. And uh, he basically, I guess, he's, he's, a, he's a liberal scholar. I, and I guess he really embodied what liberalism means. And he took it seriously. Uh, and so he accepted it and he supported me and he encouraged me. Uh, and if it hadn't been for him, I honestly don't know what would have happened to me. I, I had another um, professor that in the committee, you need to have three in the department who, who are, sit on your committee. And, you know, one of them took me aside one day and had a little chat to me about how in academia it's about building bricks of knowledge in the wall and as, as a person of faith, I, and it was a secular wall and as a person of faith I probably wouldn't be able to do it and why don't I just go away and write about Islam uh leave leave the program and go and write books about Islam so I was like (laughs) that was really hard Hmm. that was actually really hard had to find figure out a way to be a person of faith inside the secular academy when it was hostile to me as 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 a Muslim. Well, we're very glad that you did. <laughs> you um you would have looked at um the anti-hijab roots. I remember reading, and I hope you you'll be able to pick me up on this. Was it an Algerian, a French um governor of Algiers who wrote in, I don't know, the 1800s back to Paris saying to break the back. It's a famous letter to break the back of the resistance. We must get the women out of the veil and get them, you know, and, and see who, and get them out of the house and out of the veil. So in that way, the women as the women as Muslim women, veiled Muslim women, specifically as bastions and protectors of the faith um, has been really important. And there's been a French colonial obsessions with Muslim women and modesty ever since is that something that you found in your research I did find that in my research I I can't recall the actual letter that you're talking about but it was um very widespread it wasn't only in Algeria it was in Morocco too Mm. and it was also in English uh, colonial rule over Egypt Lord Cromer was was also known to to say things like that about how we have to force these people to imbibe western civilization if they don't if they don't accept it willingly and the British missionaries in Egypt, uh, 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 one of them that I remember from my research, Zwima, I don't remember how to pronounce his name, but basically it's like if we get the girls for Christ, we've got the nation for Christ. And mm-hmm. so it was right across. They, 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 they made very explicit attempts to um, even rebuild streets and change the architecture. I remember one Moroccan governor because at the time the houses were built with the walls facing the streets uh, to very tiny little windows because they were surrounded. The houses were built around inner courtyards, mm. right? The, uh, but 
they wanted to destroy it and, and make sure the houses had windows that faced onto the street so that they could, you know, see in. Seeing was uh, important to them as a way of controlling the population and definitely targeting the women because obviously a traditional society, women are the, the first, uh, even Islamically, they say that the, the mother of the nation, the the child grows until he's whatever she's five or six years old with the woman if you that's so that's why the missionary said if you get the girls for christ you get you get egypt for christ i find it very interesting that that the french colonial mission <laughs> couldn't even leave the muslim women veiled in their own nations in morocco tunis and algeria even there and of course, then, then when they when they force this uh, idea of Frenchness onto Muslims and they come to France, we need definitely this is not the French way, you mm. know. And, and mm. unfortunately, some of the most vociferous um, sisters who are anti veil now do come from these places where it would have been emotionally ripped and psychologically ripped from them. Did, mm. did you go go much into colonialism in your studies and in the book? I started by trying to figure out why the people around me were so hostile to the, to the headscarf and what was the source of that in Western culture. So I did go into colonialism uh, and I tried to trace it back as far as I could. And honestly, I was unable. I haven't really seen anybody. Everyone quotes from um, a British uh, lady, Mary Mortley Montague, who was the wife of a British ambassador in Turkey, I believe. 1776 or something that was the earliest reference I could find and she says uh, you know the veil is not oppressive so that was one of the first instances I could find of this idea uh, whether or not it exists in medieval discourse I, I wasn't able to come across that there was a tendency more to focus on Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him yeah. as a false prophet in medieval discourse but maybe it exists, I don't know, maybe the medieval European women were wearing the veil, so it wasn't, it wasn't so, t I don't know, but I, but honestly, I, I don't think any, I haven't been able to find out why or where did this idea that of oppression came from. I can understand about backwardness and being uncivilized and all of that, but the actual concept of being oppressed. So when I went through the colonial era, by then it was sort of already established in Western discourse. Uh, and the veil was the sign of the oppression of Muslim women, but also of the backwardness. It was taken as the symbol of the entire region. It served as what they call in, in academic language a metonym. It stood in for the entire region of their backwardness. I'm, I'm looking as well um, through your work and thinking about the Western Christian views you mentioned there about you know, Christianize the women and we'll, and we'll get the society. And, that, and that's definitely clearly been a, a movement that, that still goes on. But I wonder about the, the way that um, once colonialism had taken place across the Middle East and, of course, the Raj, uh, the British Empire in India, this there was a new centralized system, wasn't there? It's like come to the center, the beating heart of Europe. And once there, you have to to go to you have to have your own banking and you, you, you're coming out to work and yet at the time Europe didn't even recognize the the legal existence of women was was there was there any do you think there was any envy there envy of Muslim women yes because because there, there must have been well or an anxiety perhaps because there's certainly the Victorian system of women should be seen and not heard there's a lot of Victoriana that crept into to India at the time mm. of men's views of women of sure she should be seen and not heard that wasn't that wasn't there that wasn't the the Islamic empowerment it's probably the latter of what you said about anxiety uh, and uh, Obviously, if you're socialized into a system of control and of relations and you go somewhere and you find it different, then you want to introduce what you know. Uh, you want to introduce it as what you know, uh, as, as the quote unquote proper relations and system of control and relations between men and women. I mean, I, th I don't know if I should say this, but I think even the early Muslim community experienced that. I know that when they the first community moved from, from Mecca to Medina and they found the Ansara women were known to be sort of more outspoken and more this and that. And some of the Meccans were a bit like, whoa, 
what are, what are these women? What are these women? Uh, so the the uh, definitely the at the time of that colonial era, certainly in England, I think that uh, it was the Married Women's Property Act. Now, I, I didn't check this before mm-hmm. our interview, but I think it was 1871. I might be wrong about the date. Uh, <clears throat> so when the woman married, she became the property and, and her, her property and herself became the property of her husband. In Islamic law, women had their own um, disabilities through the law, but they were legal persons. They were able to own property, to trade and exchange. And definitely the the English patriarchal system uh, disempowered them in many ways under colonialism. Catherine, talk to us about um, the way that... that, that, uh... Since women, since Muslim women are, are, are represented in the West now in large numbers, arguably this is the the, the biggest representation of of Muslimness uh, outside of Muslim lands ever in history. Right? Mm. There is. Do you recognise a movement to make Muslim women fear and dislike the hijab, and has that actually taken hold within our communities invisibly? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I, the discourse that the veil was oppressive uh, was first, okay, we don't know when it first started, but it was definitely taken up in the colonial era and it was about Europeanizing, turning them into, you know, the good Victorian angel in the home, like you said. It mm. wasn't necessarily feminist empowerment the way we would see it, but when Christendom fell away as sort of like the moral compass for a lot of people and we ended up with secular secular societies and then feminists took up this concept of the veil as a symbol of oppression but for the different reasons that I mentioned before because of the way of inhibiting sexuality and and controlling the way you show your beauty in public it's a different rationale, but the end result is the same or the targeted criticism is the same. And now we have this, uh, these poly- a- anti-face veil and anti-headscarf policies, you know, going around the world. And they seem to be spinning around more this feminist idea. Maybe it's because of the 60s or something. I know that in France, some of the arguments put forward by people against the headscarf and the veil are uh, about sexuality. And, in, you know, um, basically it's about the right of the male gaze. We have the right to look at women. We want to look yeah. at women. We want to see your face. Yeah. The, the Quebec premier, when yeah. he was talking against the face veil, we want to, he actually said, we want to see your face. And this is a, this is a masculinist gaze that, is present in the colonial time. Like I, I found quotations from colonial um, men talking to each other. It's like, oh, there are so many beautiful women here. These these men are like keeping a cache of treasures, and we should force them to to expose. Like, why are we being denied this? The you know, this is, they they somehow see it as their right to look upon these these mm. beautiful treasures. Mm. And women adopt a masculinist gaze because of that. Uh, of that experience, they know that men look and women like to be looked at. So they know that if you're mm. covered up, you can't be looked at in that same way. Yeah. And so uh, there's definitely this focus on the idea of the veil as making you be- um, ugly, uh, you know, not beautiful, not suitable for the masculine gaze. There are there are a lot of young women in the Muslim community yeah. who want to put on the headscarf and their families will tell them, don't, you'll never find a husband. Right. We're so, not very, we're not very good though, Dr. Catherine, are we at um, making the argument of independence from the male gaze? I think that's been lacking uh, or not promoted enough within our own communities. Would you, would you agree with that? Is that something you'd, you'd recognize? Actually, my book, the last chapter, I tried to make the case for independence from the male gaze. And a lot of women, a lot of the young women say that they put it on, they feel empowered now because they're removed from the male gaze. My my beauty is none of your business. 
uh, inter interact with me as an intellect. I'm 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 a I'm a person with capabilities. I'm in the public space. My beauty is removed. Don't male gaze me. So I actually think a lot of young women find those ideas very empowering. I think inside the community, though, unfortunately, that there, there is still a, a great emphasis on the male gaze, and it's all about being beautiful for for the potential husband. And you know, you hear stories about the at the wedding, you know, at the wedding party, and the the aunties are all out checking it out, all the young girls. And we have uh, internalized uh, racism. So if the skin is darker, then you're going to be a problem. And if you've got yeah. lighter skin, you know, you'll be sought after by all the aunties for marriage. So inside our community, I think we've also adopted a, a masculinist gaze. Uh, uh, maybe it maybe it sits in contradiction with this I, with this idea of a headscarf and what it's for. But I think, you know, Islamically, we don't necessarily i'm not sure the the headscarf is really about the male gaze in the same way it is when we're talking about it to the secular liberal society because it's so much more than that it's so much more it's about us and god why can't we be accepted as fully fledged believers before our creator exactly yeah it is the, the, the women in Christianity, the nuns who are the ones left, like women in Christianity used to cover their heads with headscarves or veils or and then it got reduced to when you enter church, you, you, you cover and then that was disappeared as well. But people, I think, recognise the legitimacy of the nuns who cover, but they're, they're, they know their place in society, if you like. Like they're on the outskirts, yes, mm -hmm. they do good work and they're charitable and all that, blah, blah, blah. But but Muslim women are, I think, an affront because we're not just we're not just in in we're not just in the uh what's the word, the nunneries. I don't know if that's a contemporary Convent. word. Convent. Convent. Yeah. <laughs> get thee to although Shakespeare, yes. the famous line, get thee to a nunnery, thee to a nunnery. was Hamlet to Ophelia. <laughs> So we, we, we're trying to claim our space in the professional world. You know, you're a journalist, a, a, a writer. Uh, I'm trying to teach in a university. Uh, Muslim women want to, want to wear their headscarves and be part of the world, the secular world. They want to work as pharmacists, as teachers, as doctors, as police women. Uh, and I, I think people just find that affronting. Let's move forward to two, two final questions. Are you optimistic about the possibility now of the Western world accepting another cultural narrative? Um, we could let, let, let's talk about Toronto. Let's talk about Canada and Europe. There's a split, I think, between people who are able to embrace alternate narratives and to be empathetic towards different worldviews and people who feel affronted and threatened and are now hunkering down. The people who are hunkering down in some countries, especially in Europe, seem to be taking the reins of power. Mm. There's a pushback, definitely in Canada, there's a pushback amongst, uh, amongst those who are more open to alternate narratives in the US as well, I don't, and maybe less so in Australia. So... Actually, right now, I don't feel optimistic, but I, th I think there's this great struggle going on. And Muslims, we have allies and we have, I think, a responsibility to continue the efforts to make our case, even though I feel disappointed that my 2001 book hasn't had a, the major impact that I assumed it would. But I, but I think that this is the struggle of this life. And we, we have we absolutely have to keep it up because if they don't hear, if we don't make the effort to put our voices out there to give that the person who is potentially going to become an ally, then it's on us. Like we have to have that material there so that they can find it. 
Final question, what advice can you give to the Muslims, especially in relation to rediscovering their literacy and literary heritage, maybe in families, but but even as, as adult individuals, just get reading again. What advice can you give to start us off? The, the, the families should start reading to their kids and create an, a love of books in the family, in, in, inside the house. And the school should promote reading and book clubs and literacy and have amazing libraries full of wonderful books. And you can have uh, excursions and trips to libraries, the work that you're doing with the Islamic Literary Society. I mean, I remember when I first converted, the Muslims would joke uh, how about how Muslims in, in our friend circle would joke about how Muslims don't read. And they'd say, you know, you go on the subway and you look around and all the non-Muslims are sitting there with their books and the, and, and the Muslims aren't. So there's this somehow this joke that Muslims don't read. And I suspect it's been tied to the authoritarian cultures that many of them come to, because once you start allowing the population to read and then they start thinking for themselves. Mm. But we live in, alhamdulillah, free societies. We should take advantage of that. And people are taking, taking advantage of that. You know, amongst the second generation, there's so much thirst for books, for kids' books, for it's, it's definitely happening. There's a literary renaissance happening. Mashallah. It's been an absolute pleasure to meet with you. And um, I'd like to speak to you about a follow on interview. Um, let's arrange a date for that, inshallah ta'ala, if you're agreeable. I, I want to go into I Dream of Genie, which I watched when I was a kid, pure harem male 1950s fantasy, and also Merlin and uh, Stargate. Is it Stargate? Stargate. Yeah, mm-hmm. the image of the the Muslim women in the veil, and I, I, I why didn't you put Maleficent in there? Maleficent. Uh, ah. <laughs> uh, I'd have to have. I didn't. I didn't look. I mean, I watched that movie, but uh, you know, when you when you're writing, you don't have space. To, it's it's hard to put in everything, right? If, if they if you get if you have to analyze and explain and give all the examples. I think I'm going to send you. I'm I'm going to set you some homework. I'm I'm going to get you to watch that movie again and add Maleficent in. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you. you. You've really helped all of us to kind of summarize our ideas. I know you feel that you haven't made a change, but honestly, um, reading that as I did when when I I first came uh, to Islam in 2010, about 2012, I came across the paper. And it was like, oh gosh, somebody speaking my language. I'm not crazy. It's it's a huge help. Um, you're a huge, um, you know, and you know, a symbol of you know resistance and and helpfulness and academia. And we thank you so much for your work, Dr. Catherine Bullock. And we'll speak to you soon, inshallah. Inshallah, Jazakallah Haran for the chance to talk to you. Mashallah. That that to me is, uh, you know, subhanAllah, an interview with uh, an icon whose work is incredibly pivotal into shaping our thoughts, really, to an academic understanding of what the veil means to other communities and to ourselves and to raise those questions about why we wear it, how we wear it, the impact it has and how to help each other. Um, I make dua for you. May Allah ta'ala bless you. May Allah increase us in ilm. Ya Rabbi Zidni ilmi. May Allah bless all of our writers, including Dr. Catherine. And I'll see you again, inshallah ta'ala. If you like this video, don't forget to share it to your platforms. Don't forget to subscribe to the Islamic Literary Society. And I'll put a link as well to uh, my YouTube channel. And uh, may Allah bless you. See you again, inshallah.